Thanks for coming. Uh, it has been a very long time since we can meet physically, so I'm really happy to see the whole community back again. Um, so today I'm talking about uh, static analysis, uh, especially uh, written in data log. And uh, for me, it has been a very long journey uh, doing this. So it's now nearly eight years ago. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the background. So I, I helped starting a research lab in Brisbane many years ago. And the topic there was um, static analysis, and it's still a topic there. It's the Sun Microsystems Labs in Brisbane, and now it's called Oracle Labs. And way back, the issue was really how to efficiently and, and um, um, efficiently implement static analysis for large systems code. And uh, the issue is really there that uh, when you write static analysis, uh, an analysis tools for large systems code, it, it's really challenging because you have languages like C, C++ you want to analyze. And the semantics of these languages is very complex, but also uh, writing these bug finding tools for very specific analysis like buffer overflows is, is, is challenging in the sense of finding the right balance between the precision of finding these bugs and uh, getting results in, in time. So we discovered very quickly that uh, implementing these static analysis tools is um, very hard. You need a very large engineering team for this. And we wanted to find out about eight years ago uh, are there alternative ways to write static analysis tools? And this is not just for bug finding, by the way. You find static analysis tools in all sorts of different setups. You find them in compilers for optimization work. You find them in decompilers and in testing setups. So static analysis is really quite omnipresent, and you would like to have really tools which help you to write these static analysis systems quickly. And the reason is really that you want to have a way to explore the design space, specifically finding out uh, this sweet spot between uh, the effort of um, precision and scalability. And the other issue is, of course, you want to have it as quickly as possible in the sense that if you have programs to analyze with million lines of code, uh, that's really a, a big challenge. And so what we did is we really read a lot of literature way back, and there was always a reoccurring theme starting from the 80s. You see a lot this theme of data log and static program analysis. It's a very important people in our community like Tom Raps, Ullman, they all discovered very quickly that there is a link between static program analysis and data log. So just a brief overview of data log, it's really a variant of Prolog, you can say. It's a very simple variant. Uh, it has no backtracking mechanisms. If you don't do a top-down solver, so if you do bottom-up, it's, it's really very nice how you can implement a simple data log engine. It sort of has a very restricted horn close format. So it's the way how you write it is declarative. Uh, it's, it's quite expressive. Uh, but still, the uh, syntax and semantics is, is clean. And if you look deep into the implementation of these data log engines, you see quite interesting things, which is very familiar to the static analysis community. So you see uh, a set lattice of tuples. You see uh, fixed point semantics to compute a solution for these data log programs. You see here also some very efficient ways of computing these solutions using something called a semi-naive evaluation. And this was really something very big in those days because without having 
detailed semantic knowledge uh, of a data log program, it tries to really minimize the computations for uh, solving this. And this is done via sort of memorization of what is the new knowledge in the current fixed point iteration. And with that, we can build new, new knowledge. And so with this kind of um, sort of delta approach, uh, evaluations can be done very efficiently. And then simple things like a transitive closure can be expressed in just two lines. So the first line says a path xy is, um, exists if there is an edge xy. And then you have sort of the transitivity of saying uh, there is a path xz if there is an edge xy um, and connecting with a path yz. So with just two lines, you can express something when you write it in a simple programming language like Python or Go. You would need some bit of code just expressing this fixed point semantics. And uh, even if you want to have it more efficiently done, then you have to write even more code using some notions of indices, fast lookups, and so on. So in some ways, it's really expressive in the sense that in this declarative style, you can express quite a bit, and we have this underlying lattice semantics. Um, here I want to highlight really this deep connection why we see this data log theme occurring in static analysis again and again. And um, on uh, the left-hand side, what you see here is the standard abstract interpretation framework as introduced by Cousseau in 1977. So you see we have this issue of having an undecidable uh, semantics um, in the concrete domain, and to make it decidable, you introduce a notion of imprecision, and uh, you build a new lattice, um, the abstract domain, and this abstract domain then is able to compute uh, useful results. So it may not be as precise as in the concrete semantic, the actual computation of your program, and then you build this Galois connection. And what you see here are really fixed point calculations. You see fixed point calculations in action to build uh, result information about your program. When it comes now to data log evaluation, you see clearly a link because uh, what we have here on uh, the data log evaluation side, we have also a lattice. And this lattice is a tuple set lattice. So it's really just having all the tuples in your program and any kind of subset can be constructed from it, building a lattice. The rules, the data log rules, are these transfer functions, uh, or we can say the approximations. And there are two quite significant um, sort of terminology terms in data log. One is called EDP. You can say this is the initial state, this is the input of your data log program. Uh, for this simple path problem, it was the set of edges. And uh, the output is called IDB, the intentional database. So you have these two sets, and you, I hope you see that there is this connection that at the end you can express abstract domains and fixed point calculations assuming there is a finite lattice also very easily with data log programs. So when you really want to write data log programs um, and for static analysis, uh, you need few things for your system. And um, one thing what you need, and this is quite essential, is something called uh, the extractor. And the extractor, what it's doing is really, it takes the syntax of an input program and it translates it into a relational format. You can say, this is like a spreadsheet translator. You're on one side, you have the input program, 
and the, on the other side, a spreadsheet comes out representing uh, information which is relevant for the static analysis. Mind you, there is no generic uh, general extractor. This needs to be done for each static analysis quite specifically. So if it's for Java, you may need the suit framework and build from the suit framework some intermediate representations and then convert this to uh, relational tables. Uh, if it's for, uh, for example, the EVM interpreter on blockchains, it will be something different. But the idea is really to represent these input programs in form of these input relations. Um, and then the program analysis itself um, is then represented in form of these logical rules. And then on one side, we have then the logical rules, the input representation of the uh, data log program. Um, and that gets fed into the data log engine and then the result is the result of the static analysis. So this theme shows up again and again, um, and just wanted to say the data log itself is not um, the whole system when you build the static analysis. It's only a one part of it, and building a system in data log, a static analysis system, you need more components, and one of these important components is the extractor. Data log itself is more or less a language in its own right, and you need to work a little bit more to produce these static analysis systems with it. And we see, again, this, a lot of examples in literature doing this. So here I want to just highlight how you can do a very simplistic analysis for in data log. Let's assume we want to write <clears throat> a simple security analysis in data log. And on um, the left-hand side, we have um, an input program which we want to analyze. It's a very simple Java C style language. And now what we need to do is we need to translate this input program into something that's understandable for data log. And so what we need is uh, the extractor. So the actual work of the extractor is the translation of this input program into a control flow graph and representing this control flow graph in form of the edge relation. So the edge relation x, y, for example. And the other aspect the extractor has to do here is to um, have these two um, predicates. Um, this is basically the protect statement and the vulnerable statement. And the idea of this analysis, it's a very simple analysis, is to say that we want to check in the security analysis whether when a vulnerable statement is executed, we need to execute protect prior. It's a simple security analysis. By the way, uh, this is not just a contrived example. Uh, you find these kind of examples when you do the analysis of JDK. So JDK has a very simple security analysis, a security model, and it has sort of this sort of semantic that you have uh, things you need to protect and you have vulnerable statements like opening a file. And this kind of uh, analysis are real. They are not just for, for this slide. So again, the idea of this analysis is to check whether a vulnerable statement uh, has a guard executed prior, in that case, protect. And how we write this sort of uh, security analysis in data log is really quite elegant. You just need three lines of data log code. Uh, the first one is you need to define a new predicate. And this predicate is called unsafe. And it just indicates the region in the program uh, which uh, is not safe. So if you have a 
vulnerable statement in this unsafe region, there is a violation. And you can express this nicely in form of this last line here, where we say a violation in statement X is happening if it's a vulnerable statement and is in this unsafe region. Uh, the unsafe region itself can be defined nicely in form of a recursion. We can say the first statement in the program is unsafe because we didn't have the opportunity to execute a protect statement. And then we have this recursive rule saying uh, a statement Y is unsafe if a statement X is unsafe X and Y are connected via uh, an edge, and the statement Y is not a protect statement. So we basically propagate um, the unsafety through this control flow graph, and we stop when we see protect statements. So really quite simple. It's really a few lines, and I hope you agree that writing three lines is better than three, four pages of code in C, C++ or Java expressing this kind of semantics. So now the big question is, why hasn't been done in industry? So in industry, um, you know, it's all about productivity. You really want to um, get your products out, your static program analysis tools out as quickly as possible. And the question is, why hasn't been data log been used in industry for a long time? And th there are two reasons, and I hope this is the theme of my talk, two reasons why data log did not work out in industry till recently, I hope. Uh, and the first is that standard data log implementations are very slow. Uh, they are based on uh, disks and databases. So this is a sort of more historical view that uh, it goes back into the database community when they wanted to replace SQL with something more sophisticated. In that case, it was data log. And that failed because in the database community, uh, they said that um, recursion is not really necessary in applications. And so that really killed data log in the 90s in databases. Um, and from those days, we have these database centric implementations, which are too slow for static analysis. They don't really um, specialize relations any kind of query is possible. And the main reason is here is really that um, the rules we have in our static analysis setup will not change. Whereas in the database community, rules should or can always change. That, that's sort of the, the, the assumption. So start, start, standard data log implementations are too slow. That's one thing. The other thing is that um, the data log language itself is nice for simple problems, but for real static analysis problems, you need quite a bit of extensions to express uh, real world situations uh, much better. So in some ways, um, we have a lot of assumptions. So one is the termination assumption. So in if you look up the data log semantics and interpretation, then you see that the data log systems always terminate. This is what you read in literature, but this termination guarantee comes not for free. So you have then only a finite set of constants in a data log program and you have no functors. Um, then the other thing is, and this is more a software engineering aspect, you don't have typing information for columns and uh, functors, of course, if you would use functors. And so typing, what we discovered, is really key for expressing these large data log programs. And we see now data log programs with hundreds and hundreds of rules for real static analysis problems. 
And the last thing is, for example, is uh, standard data log really doesn't has, have deletion of, of tuples. So this is, might be useful. So in, in the data log world, you only add information. You can never really delete information. And a notion of deletion is always useful, um, especially if you have growing lattices in your abstract interpretation world and you want to prune some information in these lattices. So deletion is, is really of, of, of good use here. And here is really an example to highlight that um, um, classical data log systems may not be so fast. So we did an experiment many years ago, and we tried to implement this simple transitive um, closure problem in C++. And if you are an experienced C++ programmer, then you see we use some uh, sort of SDL data structures, but we exploit some index properties of SDL. So underlying, there is a red black tree, which is used for uh, sorted uh, data in, in C++ and in these data structures. And with this, we can really write quite efficiently a transitive closure example. So this is what an experienced C++ static analysis engineer would write to compute the static, uh, to the, compute the transitive closure. And you see also here a little bit of semi-naive evaluation. So we remember what kind of new path we discovered in the previous iteration. So we call this the delta. And then with that, we can discover the new paths of the current iteration. Just to summarize, if you do it by hand, we, you can get it. I mean, this was done on an older i7 computer. You get it in two seconds and 34 megabytes. And if you use sort of a uh, off-the-shelf data log engine like MuZ from Z3, uh, in those days it took 340 seconds, and you need much, much more memory. And the question is, again, why is there is this performance gap? Um, and it boils down to very general evaluation algorithms, so it um, needs more specialization for the concrete program, quite bad data structures, and in that case, no index management. And the question is, can we build data log engines for static analysis, uh, analysis which can then overcome these issues? So I really want to talk now at um, the remaining part of this talk about Souffle. So Souffle is our system we developed in a time frame of approximately eight years. It's a research effort, so we could publish very nice papers on it. But on the other hand, it's also industrially used. So it's really running um, in Amazon VPC networks or used to. Uh, it, it's used for um, uh, bytecode, or you can say smart contract analysis. It's used in uh, bigger companies for security issues, like Oracle used it, used it for uh, Java JDK analysis. So it's, it's, it's not just an academic project, it's used in industry. And uh, here, basically, two aspects of it. We needed to extend the data log language itself to make data log more expressive as a DSL for static analysis. And we needed to implement quite sophisticated uh, translation techniques for data log to achieve speed similar to handcrafted C++ code. Of course, we couldn't do it without making assumptions. And this souffle system um, has the underlying assumption that rules never change. So this is really quite um, different to the database world where rules may change, but here we had to make these assumptions that rules do not change for one static analysis. And we assume basically that the facts, the input of these data log programs is the input program representation in form of this produced by the extractor and the other thing what we assumed is that 
uh, we wanted to have these data log programs executed in memory. We did not want to have these indices on disk because we knew it will be too slow. And mind you, when we started, it was really this boost in terms of uh, bigger machines with much more memory. So about 10 years ago, it started to have really these huge machines with maybe one terabyte of RAM. Um, and and uh, this we, we wanted to exploit. And we wanted also to exploit the parallelism of the underlying uh, CPUs. So these are the assumptions we made when we started building Souffle. And we were actually quite strict with Souffle. So instead of having more an academic approach, having a great idea and uh, solving this problem, uh, so more blue sky research, we, we didn't follow that approach. We said, and mind you, this started at Oracle Labs in Brisbane, we started saying, whatever we do needs to be driven by the application. So in those days, we built a security analysis for the JDK, and this dictated what we needed to do. So we, from the application, we got the requirements, and then we implemented it, and then we got boosts in, in implementing the implica, uh, application, and then we continued again. And we followed very strictly this sort of design philosophy in Souffle, and that really helped us um, to produce souffle as it is now. So without this, we couldn't really have achieved um, sort of the performance and the features needed to build these static analysis systems we see now written in souffle. So uh, I want now to talk a little bit about these language extensions of um, data log. And um, I can't introduce all these extensions. I want to just pick three examples. And I want to motivate why they are very useful for static analysis. But uh, just a quick overview of the language itself. It is sort of, it has been organically grown the last few years. It sort of was inspired by a tool um, by Wally. So it's BDD. BDDB, um, that is one of the old data log engines, and the language Souffle uses is sort of inspired by this. Muzet from Z3, it's sort of a, um, in the toolbox of Z3, there's a data log engine. We use this and logic blocks, of course, uh, as well as the guidance. We developed a type system for attributes in relation, so we saw, we saw that uh, types are really essential for building these larger uh, systems in data logs. So without this, uh, you have small little mistakes projecting maybe a variable type into an uh, object type when you write a points to analysis in Souffle. And so these types were really crucial uh, to have. And then also we have very sophisticated types of um, uh, allow recursive data structures, uh, which goes way beyond standard data log. Then we have other extensions like components. So they allow to uh, make compositions of data log programs easier. Uh, we are not quite there yet. So it would be good to have uh, a better compositional model. We have arithmetic functors, which really is only heard in prolog, but not in data log. So we have these functors, aggregation and user-defined functors to break out of, of the data log world to call uh, libraries in C++ or in whatever language you want. So the first is really just to break termination with functors. So we, we saw very early on that functors are essential so the introduction of new constants. And it came up when we implemented a points to analysis for Java, and we needed to introduce new contexts of points to assignments in the abstract domain um, on the fly. And um, first, we just did this by number. So we had sort of a 
number representation when encoding for these contexts. And uh, here is a simple um, souffle program which uses an arithmetic uh, functor. And how it works is that we have here a relation. And in souffle, you need to declare relations. You can't just use them um, like in any uh, old dialogue dialect. You really need to declare it so that the users has to specify type information for attributes. And with this type information, we get safety writing these larger code bases in Dialog. So the first is what we do is we have a fact here. We say the set A or relation A with one column, a number column, uh, has uh, the value one. And then we say um, if there is um, a value in this set and the value is less than 10, we just say there is a new value in the set um, incremented by one. And uh, with this, you can see very quickly that termination guarantees uh, uh, fall flat very quickly by, say, if I would omit, uh, omit this constraint i less than 10, uh, it would run out of memory very quickly, this example and it would not work anymore. So functors are crucial for static analysis. Um, you need to introduce new values on the fly, and functors were the means for doing this. We discovered very quickly that numeric encodings of contexts is not really a good way forward. Um, this is too cumbersome for um, developers, and so we introduced notions of records, and we did this by relating numbers to, um, you can say, constructors or um, tuples. And so we have sort of a type declaration. We say dot type, then the fields and the types of the fields. And what it's really doing here is we then can relate um, these. In this example, we have pairs as a record. We can relate numbers to unique numbers to these pairs, and we have an underlying um, sort of data structure keeping all the seen pairs. And then uh, there are two options when I have see it, then the engine sees a new pair, either the pair is already in the table, then we re return the reference of that pair, or if it's not, then we create a new entry in the table uh, and, and return this as a reference number. So the relation itself is not really, it doesn't store the pairs, it stores reference numbers, which then go into the pair relation, the type relation. And um, this indirection is done fully transparent and seamlessly for, for the end user. And we, this construction of values uh, was very important for us uh, for example, to really describe contexts in points to analysis uh, more expressively. We can extend this, of course, having notions of recursive lists. Um, and uh, this is used, say, if your context is unbounded. So if you don't want to limit the call stack to five or six, then you have this issue of unbounded recursions. And this is also possible with these records because you have these reference numbers and then directly in the constructor, you store the reference numbers to build recursive lists uh, in, in the system, in the type system of um, souffle. The last bit, which is quite exciting, that data log also allows symbolic computations if you spin this idea of records further. Uh, we can also uh, have notions of algebraic types. You can say these are notions of polymorphic records. So we have here, for example, a term. And here it's a simple example of implementing piano arithmetic. So if you want to build a simple proof system for showing uh, why 1 plus 1 is equal to, then you can do this in um, 
in souffle using these algebraic types, you can say dot type term equal zero. So this is basically one notion of a record which hasn't got any information. It's represent the zero value, the successor um, of a term and the addition. And then what we need is sort of a um, uh, equivalence relation. Souffle has equivalence relation building these term equivalences and then we can do simple rules like a plus zero equal a or transforms to a or a plus success of b success of a plus b. And this can now be expressed quite nicely in souffle uh, doing, uh, using these algebraic data types. The last language element which I want to introduce is um, subsumption. So subsumption is um, the idea of deleting elements, and so the concept um, is not fairly new, so it has been introduced by Gussing and Kiesling in the 90s um, in data log, but we have an efficient implementation of subsumption, and for example, if you have interval arithmetic, which shows up very often in static analysis, and you want to show that, uh, or delete an interval which is subsumed by a bigger interval, you can write now these subsumption rules where you have a dominated and a dominating tuple. You set this in relation uh, by a condition and then uh, the dominated tuple will be deleted. So that's, that's also an exciting feature in Souffle, which really helps if you want to implement SMT solvers in directly in Souffle. Of course, there are some open questions. Um, so one of these questions is, um, how can we support better symbolic computations? Uh, there were recent works uh, for saturation solvers, equivalent saturation solvers, for example, egg, and they have really implemented, so this was University of Washington, implemented uh, such a term rewriting system in Souffle. Uh, there still needs some improvements in terms of implementation of these subsumption rules to make things faster and more expressive for end users. Another exciting direction are recursive aggregation. So there is uh, quite a bit of research in the database world about uh, recursive aggregation. Um, another topic is higher order logic. So how can we implement reflection like in Java for data log? Um, the problem here is to find a good sweet spot between expressiveness and how fast you can execute it. Um, and uh, another important topic is how can we compose data log programs better? So this composability is not quite there yet. We have components, but we feel this is not really the right answer at the moment and more work would need to be done to compose logic programs better. I have only a few minutes left, so I will rush you a little bit over the implementation side of Souffle. That was really the big challenge, uh, making Souffle as fast as handwritten code or close to be as fast as handwritten code. And the main idea we used is really uh, these ideas of Futamura projections. Uh, so the idea is that you have a language expressed in form of an interpreter, you have an input program, and what you do now is you amalgamate the input program with the interpreter to generate a new program, it's called the mix function, and then as a result you get uh, the input program, the specialized input program in the language of the interpreter. And we do this not just once, we do it in form of a hierarchy. And the interesting part of this is that the specialization works very, very well for uh, data log itself because it has these uh, fixed point semantics. So doing the specialization ideas uh, for general languages have been tried. I mean, Oracle has, for example, the CRAWL framework and that works quite well but it's not easy for declarative languages or other languages. But for data log, uh, the specialization ideas really work well. Um, and this is what we use. 
uh, souffle itself has two different modes of execution. So recently, uh, we have added a very high-speed interpreter, but the standard mode was really the synthesis where the data log program comes in and the C++ program comes out. And uh, we have this sort of a pipeline where the data log program uh, gets translated to an abstract syntax tree. Uh, there we have a lot of optimizations, high-level logic optimizations. Then it gets lowered to something called a relational algebra machine. Uh, it's sort of like you can say the assembly of relational um, uh, languages. And then this gets further translated to C++ or with this new interpreter, it can be executed on the spot for applications like um, uh, network analysis where different nodes executed on the fly these uh, analysis. Uh, we couldn't really use the C++ compiler, so high-speed interpreters were necessary uh, using very sophisticated data structures based on despecialization. Um, the thing here is really that these relations in memory are just not just simple tables. Uh, we had to do quite a bit of work to make the access to these relations super fast. And uh, the idea here is that relations are represented as clusters of indices. So you have one cluster of indices for one relation, and uh, these indices are specific to your program. So if you would change the rules, you may not really have a working program anymore. So you basically look through all these rules, you specialize this cluster uh, for your given program, and this gives you the speed. Unfortunately, when you do this by hand, you have a nasty exponential problem, super exponential problem at your hand, M is the number of attributes. Uh, we could come up with a really sophisticated a uh, selection mechanism based on some discrete optimization problems. It's related to Dilworth's problem, and it translates to a maximum matching problem. So the idea here is that when you have a rule, you have in the body a set of relations, and you need to search them. You can break these searches up into uh, primitive searches, and so basically condensing to the attributes which are really relevant for the given search, you can put this into a lattice, and then you can sort of say that an index becomes a chain in this lattice, and you want to have a minimum number of indices just covering these primitive searches which show up in your rules. And the good news is really that uh, at the end this can be solved by a maximum matching problem, so just really textbook style maximum matching where we have very efficient algorithms and uh, so we can translate this minimum index selection problem to a um, minimum chain cover problem using Tilver's theorem and that gets translated to a maximum matching problem. We had a very nice paper on uh, at VLDB on this some years ago and um, I just wanted to highlight that quite sophisticated compilation technologies under Souffle to really make the execution super fast. Um, the indices itself um, can be configured. So they are memory indices, but can be configured. We have a portfolio of different indices. So we have um, a more general data structure, which is very fast. It's the B tree data structure. We implemented an optimistic um, sort of uh, locking uh, uh, procedure protocol for uh, these B trees, but we have also tried other structures, equivalence relations, and then we have sort of a more general framework how to plug in new different types of uh, data structures into Souffle. Here, just an example. Uh, for Souffle's performance, we talked about this transitive closure at the beginning. Um, and the good news is we can even beat the handcrafted SDL version because we can fully specialize these indices um, and, and get even better speed 
by uh, using these B trees and especially um, switching the execution, the evaluation of dialog into a parallelized version using um, uh, multiple threads doing the execution. So these data log programs have an enormous degree of parallelization and all this can be exploited very efficiently. So the question is now, what are the open questions? Um, so clearly there's uh, more work which can be done in the data structure space to make the evaluation even faster. Uh, so there is this interesting aspect of self-computing data structures. So we could use, for example, find union to implement transitive closures and equivalence and symmetry, uh, these kind of properties directly in the data structure. But there are other really interesting directions like uh, join orders, worst case optimal join orders, or incremental evaluation where we want, don't want to recompute the whole static analysis. We only want to uh, uh, we want to reuse previous uh, results and um, make the evaluation even faster. Okay, so uh, quickly to tooling. Um, the idea of tooling is we need tools. Um, I can't talk too much about tooling, but I have two slides here. One is provenance, so as you can see, this is um, how tuples are derived and uh, there are ways to um, construct post-mortem in this data log, fixed point evaluations, these proof trees explaining why a tuple exists in the result. Um, and this is done via lightweight proof annotations and then post-mortem, these proof trees can be constructed. We had a nice topless paper on this. Um, and also we can explain negation why uh, things uh, do not exist, but this needs to be driven by the user. And then, of course, we uh, need profiling. Uh, we can then hopefully identify the bottlenecks, and there's quite a bit of tooling for souffle related to profiling. There are open questions um, related to tooling, of course, automated testing. Max Planck Institute had recently very nice papers to test data log uh, quite efficiently using sort of delta debugging ideas and um, uh, semantic ideas for testing, um, extraction tools, IDEs, all these are still things which need to be discussed in future. So before I stop, I want to give you a brief overview how souffle is used in industry. So these are just examples, there are many more but we started with Java security uh, way back in 2014. And uh, there the idea was that we needed to find security issues um, in the Java JDK code. So where, uh, for example, these protect statements, which we discussed before in the example, were not placed correctly in finding these issues. Um, so this was one example. Another one was Amazon used to fly for VPC networks. So they have software defined networks and they had specifications, which node can talk to which node. And uh, they used to fly for enforcing uh, these access control patterns. Another example is the NCMA framework. It's a compiler and they needed static analysis inside the compiler uh, to find parallelization uh, um, potential in C, C++ programs. So this is another example where Souffle can be used. Uh, this last example I want to mention is, which is relevant to us now, it's uh, the analysis of smart contracts. And so we built a whole uh, pipeline here for building an extractor uh, and an analysis framework for analyzing whether smart contracts for blockchains um, are semantically correct using some notion of abstract interpretation. And the most prominent example um, is the, the dupe framework. It's, it's a very generic points to analysis framework um, for Java. So just in conclusion, 
building commercial grade static analysis, uh, analysis tools in data log is, is very hard. Uh, so for us, it took us roughly eight years. Um, it really required language extensions for data log. Um, and we needed novel and very innovative implementation techniques for data log to make the static analysis tools um, really fast. Uh, we see now enormous strides, not just in Souffle, but other tools are using similar techniques now. So I see really a, a bright future uh, with data log and static analysis, but there are lots of still uh, open questions still needs to be answered, like compositional language extensions so that you can write libraries nicely, symbolic computation, incremental evaluation, and efficient data structures. And if you want, please join the effort, the Souffle effort, you find us on, on GitHub. Thanks so much. Questions? Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, if I understand correctly, in the beginning, data log was much too slow. So why did you choose data log uh, and had to make it a lot faster, which you achieved, rather than, for example, using OCaml or uh, Maud or something similar? Were those not promising enough, too slow, and without any potential for improvement? So what motivated your choice? Well, I, I could tell you now a, a, a grand story, but the reality is really that we read these beautiful data log papers and, and we were hooked to this idea of data log is a great choice. And uh, then when we started uh, using Muzet, you know, BDD, BDDB, all this fell apart. Um, when we tried to push through the JDK data sets with, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of um, uh, heap locations and 1.5 million variables. And we thought, well, can we fix it? And so it was more a naive way of approaching it rather than looking for simpler options. And um, in that way, we achieved innovation. So if we had followed OCaml, we might have had a quick solution way back in saying, oh, well, we coded in functional, which is closer to declarative than data log. But looking back from an academic viewpoint, I think it was very fruitful that we didn't give up because of innovation came through that process. Um, very important question. How come that you chose a sweet name like Souffle? <laughs> okay, um, this, uh, this, this goes way back. Um, so this goes way back to 2007. Um, uh, Christina Sifuentes and I, we set up this research lab in, in Brisbane, the Sun Microsystems Labs, doing static analysis. And we started the tool Parfait. And then there was a stream of tools using these kind of names like Souffle, Wafer, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Parfait. Uh, yeah, so there, there were this, this theme started way back. Initially, I wanted to suggest the name Crumble. But then I thought this is not a good name, and so then we chose Souffle. And uh, then uh, there is another th um, sort of translation. Look up on the Souffle homepage. There is a perfect translation. Something this. Yeah. Anyway. Yes. A more serious question. In your examples of functors, we had something like a predicate or um, uh, i is less than 10 after yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. incrementing uh, the variable i. Uh, this reminds me a bit uh, of the uh, type concepts of uh, Pascal and more elaborately Ada. But however, uh, 
do you also provide more complex or more general assertions like i is a prime number well uh, that's a good question so we discovered i mean these functors are not as generic as what you would have what you you would see in prolog so there are some restrictions and if you want complex functors the only way to really do this is to tunnel outside of the data log world and um, use user-defined functors. So if you define a user-defined functor, which is implemented in a form of a C, C++ library, then um, you can do this. But you can also implement, because Souffle is now drawing equivalent with functors, you can also implement your, uh, you know, thief, I mean, your, your algorithm of detecting whether a number is, is a prime number. It's just not very efficient because you have for these calculations, these lattices you build up, these tuple lattices. So user-defined functors, that's the answer for your question. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, so some modern data log engines like Flix also add support for arbitrary lattices. And I guess subsumption, <coughs> sorry, subsumption gets you like most of the way there, or does that give you like fully arbitrary lattices, or is there something else needed other than subsumption? I, I, we had long discussions about this, so we haven't really written up the subsumption work yet, but Flix has a very specific way of defining lattices, and we feel it's not as powerful or as ex expressive as subsumption. So there is this idea of arbitrary languages uh, is not new and it's not from us. So this goes back into the theory of computer science into the 80s and 90s where uh, a German team, uh, uh, Kiesling and Gissing and these guys, built a theory for subsumption and, and we just used it, but the challenge for us was the efficient implementation of subsumption and it's used by polyspace, so Julian, Henri and um, uh, 20, they, they use this for, for in math works. So th that, that sort of was our approach rather than having a very specific variation of uh, lattices like what Flix has. And Flix, I feel, has also a little bit of uh, uh, performance issues, but I, I like uh, the Flix approach and also I like the data fund approach. So these are all very promising um, future directions for, for the data log world. Well, thanks for the talk. So it's in fact uh, great to see that some of the challenges which were there three, four years ago, now you have solved it in the Souffle system. Yes. I wanted to ask, are the analysis that we write in Souffle by default inherently flow sensitive? And second, you mentioned about context sensitivity. So how far we are in terms of writing context sensitive analysis scalability wise? So here, I mean, this is a quite often a misconception that uh, when so souffle is not really it's it's a general purpose. I mean, in our case, it's more a, a language for expressing static analysis, and what you do with it is really up to you. But if you look at the Doop framework, you can see how you can express different variations of context sensitivity, and there are a lot of students extending this, having unbounded contexts, for example. I saw some work there. But it's really up to you what you do with this. It's not really a plug-in framework like Infer, where it's really tailored towards static analysis. It's more really a language where it's up to you to express your static analysis declaratively. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for the great talk. So. Um, it's great to see that the performance gap gets filled between Souffle and C++. But my understanding is that the, the, the nicest part of Souffle is that it um, increases uh, abstraction level so the user can, well, develop their static analysis uh, um, in a more naive way. So is there anything down or could be done to, well, less Souffle more user-friendly so people can develop a custom static analysis with Souffle? That's a good question in the sense that it is a follow-up of this one, that Souffle is really a logic language 
and and not so much tailored perfectly for for uh, static analysis yet. So what I see here is, and this will be crucial for the future of Souffle, to have better library support. Can we write libraries in a compositional fashion like you would be able to do in C++ or Python to express the static analysis problem so that users just can grab these libraries, configure it quickly, rather than writing hundreds and hundreds of lines of logic code like what Yanis is doing in Doop or uh, in, in Gigahorse at the moment, yeah? Uh, hello, thank, thank you for your talk. And my concern is uh, also about uh, flow sensitive analysis. Uh, as a motivating example, you show in your slide, uh, some data flow analysis can also be instantiated as a data flow analyzer. Um, and uh, one typical framework is a FDS based framework. And my concern is, is there also possible to uh, provide extension of the software to define some basic uh, operators in the FDS framework. And if it is possible, I, uh, because it, it is, there are many optimization techniques in the data flow analysis, such as the FDS framework, for example, to compute the summary edges. So uh, I wonder what is the advantage of the data-based analyzer compared with the traditional data flow framework because maybe your optimization underlying such a uh, data log solver is uh, is highly dependent to the how such extension uh, the design of such extensions so yeah. it's it's a really nice question because the interesting part of your question is that these ifds uh, problems or what tom reps introduced way back uh, the underlying technology of this is actually data log. So uh, there are super specialized versions of logic programs. So all the technology he used was really sort of somehow taken from these very efficient data log evaluations. So the question now is, can we express IFDS efficiently in data log? Most likely, if you have a chain kill problem, uh, you're better off using, you know, um, uh, Eric Bowden's IFDS framework in Java because that will be super fast. Um, specialized just for Chen Hill problem. And again, it will use under the hood technology uh, from the data log world. Um, Souffle is more, is better if you have these big issues yeah, where you want to combine several static analysis problems into one big framework. Uh, like, you know, uh, there is uh, Doop, for example, uh, where you have different aspects of uh, the language and then the points too. Um, this kind of, of problems um, will be better off with Souffle than IFDS, but simpler compiler problems, which need to be super fast, they might be better off with IFDS problems. If IFDS is sufficient expressing these this kind of issues. So basically, you need to choose your tool. So it's, this is all what, what I want to say. OK, thank you for answering. OK, so with that, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.